Great. Hi, everybody. Hello. Um, see everything okay? Awesome. Um, good morning. Lovely to be here. I'm talking to you today from Gadigal land. Uh, I'd like to pay my respects to um, elders past, present and future. Uh, I am going to talk today a little bit more um, about how you might be able to accelerate um, regenerative materials, uh, looking at sort of a market focused approach. Um, I run an organization called Built by Nature. We're fairly new. We've been around for about a year and uh, we are based in Amsterdam. So I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey, if you like, in terms of what we're focused on in Europe. Currently, we are focused on the European market and driving the market towards um, mass timber and uh, starting mid next year, other bio-based materials. We would like to extend this globally in the in the long haul, maybe actually kind of short term. So, um, all right. Um, so clearly, you know, Mechler knows this and we all know this, but just a reminder, um, while there's fantastic initiatives to decarbonize concrete and steel, um, will it be done in time given the massive impact that both industries um, have uh, on carbon? And so as we've heard a little bit already today, I would suggest that the tiny little black line in the bottom there in terms of the share of other materials from concrete and steel in the buildings industry needs to grow. Um, and even if that grew to sort of, you know, a, a 20 percent uh, in commercial buildings, um, it would make an enormous impact quite quickly uh, on our carbon. Um, and you know, what's what's the issue really of stopping, um, you know, either mass timber or other bio-based materials from entering the market? What we think is, is that it's actually a demand stimulus. Um, while there's often a focus on sort of, well, is there enough supply? Actually, often the supply could be there if the market was giving indicators to the suppliers and the forestry that it actually had demand for higher um, sort of uh, income products than clearing land uh, for farming or agriculture, um, which is the largest um, by far uh, deforestation cause. So there's a lack of incentives to use regenerative materials. Steel and cement are very embedded in the industry and it's completely optimized for those materials. When you look at even sort of building officials, building codes, buyer codes, all the way through to sort of policies and incentives. Um, there's insufficient demand, so how do we increase demand? And um, there's also a lack of knowledge and expertise. And I think although we're focused on this being the issue in Europe, as we're growing globally, um, we see it being pretty common. And I think also these issues are true in Australia. And then there's codes and policies that are limiting those projects and those materials from entering the market. So many new bio-based materials um, may not have the resources as they're getting started to be able to battle with codes and um, figure out how to get their products, uh, the kind of standards that they need. So um, just looking at mass timber, which has been our focus in our first year, um, we know that not only can timber substitute steel and cement in building constructions and therefore has a lower embodied carbon, um, but forests also sequester carbon. So us having sustainable forestry allows us to sequester carbon in forests. And then the third part of the sort of three S's is, is that it, they also store. So our vision when we're looking at mass timber is that we could have cities that are essentially carbon stores and they can store that carbon for a very long time while we then get about growing um, other forests uh, in, their, in their place. So there's, this is a great study, um, actually this, this uh, statistic from the left, I encourage you to look at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Change recent report on timber construction globally. It looks at um, where we'd be able to source those, that timber from, uh, what forests would it cause deforestation, would it start to cause threats to our agriculture and food supplies. Um, it's, an, it's a really um, interesting report that I think will change perhaps your perspective on, on some of those concerning issues that get sort of talked about. What we're doing at Built by Nature, again, is we're focused on the market barriers and we're trying to drive systemic solutions um, at the market level, which is quite unusual for buildings. Buildings often, you know, have some push on sort of policy in terms of philanthropy and funding. Um, they might have some push on 
some industry like decarbonization of concrete and steel, but to actually remove those barriers in the market uh, is quite unusual in terms of philanthropy funds. So we are a grant fund. Uh, we have funded about 2 million euros of projects in our first year, and we'll be funding about 2.5 million euros um, next year. Essentially, we convene networks um, across Europe, uh, both locally and pan-European. Uh, we then identify what those barriers are. We fund them through our fund in a cross-sector collaborative um, solutions focus, and then we amplify those solutions back out to the market. So what kind of solutions are needed for regenerative materials? We have found um, that there's a lack of knowledge and innovation that needs to be supported. There's an investment needed for man manufacturers to scale, especially when we're talking about bio-based materials. There's a market capacity um, building. So the knowledge, you know, we've got a few perhaps architects, engineers that might know how to do this, but uh, especially when we look at mass timber, but if we want to actually scale that, we've got to rapidly scale the skills um, amongst our design and construction industry. Uh, tools and data are lacking for these materials. Um, uh, catalyst projects always help and policy changes. So those are the kind of projects that we fund. Uh, we're very specifically focused on convening what we call the big six. Um, so those that enable buildings, uh, developers, investors, designers, asset owners, insurers, and cities. And it might seem strange to have insurers on there, but for example, in the UK, um, insurance is the biggest barrier for mass timber buildings. Currently, you cannot insure a residential mass timber project in the UK. Um, and we have funded about four projects. I think we've almost overcome that issue, but uh, we're getting there slowly. Just a little bit more on the strategy, because I think this is a strategy that can work um, across Australia as well um, again we enable we convene front runners and networks across those big six and together we've created a shared narrative for what the barriers are um, we get clarity on that our fund is then able to identify the solutions fund those solutions um, and create a sort of accelerator impact uh, once those solutions are complete we then amplify them back out through the market with the overall target of removing the barriers we have so far 25 front row organizations in 12 countries across Europe, but you'll see that some of those companies are also global. Um, so, um, you know, it's quite interesting how we see some of these sort of common barriers and solutions being needed at a global scale, which, as I said, is something that we'll be looking at um, mid, mid next year. A little example of some of these barriers, and it'll be interesting to see if some of these I, I've heard are similar to Australia, um, but you know, these are some of the projects that we've been funding. For example, in the UK, um, the new model building code, the mass timber insurance playbook are focused on um, uh, working together with the insurance industry to do sort of pre-certified insured detailing around mass timber buildings, if you like. Um, the last one that we have there, number four, is actually convening the six biggest developers in the UK, together with um, some engineering and academic help um, to do the last push around developers um, being able to get asset insurance around mass timber buildings. Uh, but we've also funded um, the third project is around us quantifying um, the other health and wellness benefits and societal benefits of doing timber buildings, for example. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have funded a project that will be coming out in March, um, dispelling some of the myths of timber buildings um, that some others in the industry like to propel, such as you're going to die from a fire and, you know, they're going to uh, crumble with the, with the first um, pouring of rain. Um, we've also funded projects around the policy uh, to help, for example, the metropolitan region of Amsterdam has a 20% policy for housing to get 20% of the new social housing to be in mass timber or bio-based materials. Uh, we funded Dark Matter Labs to be able to assess the regulatory challenges that might emerge from doing that and create a data set and tool that can actually then be scaled globally to look at how you actually implement policies around this um, around the world. Um, and then one of our current grant rounds is to actually start monetizing and quantifying the amount of carbon stored in buildings so that they could potentially be um, put out to the carbon offset market. 
Um, we're funding some global um, organizations that already are kind of the leaders in carbon verification um, to be able to bring that as a standard globally. So there's some of our work that's already emerging globally that can help uh, in Australia. And um, mid next year, we will be um, launching an initiative focused around bio-based materials more globally as well. So um, yeah, I hope you get a sense of sort of how we might move the market end to be able to allow uh, regenerative materials to be realized. Um, there's a huge need and um, you know we need to both work at the supply and the demand end simultaneously so that we don't um you know we can we can give reassurance to manufacturers that there is going to be the demand in the market um and that you know regulatory or policy barriers or knowledge barriers won't stop the scaling um as we get more materials uh emerging thank you <laughs>